think I've been intrigued with magic my entire life. When I was a kid, I met a magician and got a good slap on the hand when I tried to look into his pockets to see how he came up with his tricks. In my days of writing young adult novels, I even made a heroine, and of course, the boy she sought, amateur magicians. But even then, I saw this type of magic as make-believe, a trick of the eyes. In fact, as we all know, another word for magic is illusion. So that's why I was a bit surprised when tarot master Sasha Graham, a previous guest on this program, called one of her books The Magic of Tarot. To me, tarot holds key truths, and I know she believes this as well, and doesn't see it as anything make-believe at all. So what does she mean by the magic of tarot, and how may we benefit by it? Well, let's find out. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Sasha. Hi, Debbie. Thank you for having me. Oh, it is my pleasure, but I want to get right to it. So what do you mean by the magic of tarot? When I talk about the magic of tarot, what I'm talking about is the entire world of possibility that opens up around you when you open up a deck of tarot cards and start working with them in like a very positive and enchanted way. Uh, very succinct. <laughs> um, and you actually say that this magic has its own set of rules, though. So can you talk about that? It does. It does. So, you know, I, I, and when we talk about something like magic, I think that there's a lot of other words. I think a lot of people actually are using magic in their lives. A lot of very successful people that wouldn't necessarily call themselves magicians, but you know these people, right? Because they're, you kind of can't look away from them. They look as if they've swallowed the moon, you know? And, and so magic is really about diving into that kind of energetic field or energetic river where you're kind of like in alignment with who you are authentically. And that authentic alignment in the way that you kind of bring yourself to everything that you do in your life aligns with the expanding energy of the universe. That is magic. And the reason that tarot is so helpful is because it's literally like a roadmap. You know, it's kind of like you can check in and kind of take a really objective look at your life at your choices, at where you're going. Um, and it's kind of like a sounding board. And the deeper you move into your tarot practice, you rapidly discover that you're not necessarily reading the cards alone. Uh, and artists and poets and painters and actors understand this, right? When we're in creation mode, it's not just us. Um, and the magic is that space with which envelops us when we're doing that. And whoever or whatever that other hand is, um, is up to you to name and decide and discover what that might be for yourself. I know. I love that it's all about possibilities and because possibilities are endless, which means that you have the whole world to decide. At to your fingertips. And, and if you look at the nature of the material world, it is endless. You know, if, if you sat and decided to sort of contemplate a rose in your garden for 10 minutes, the more you focus on it, the more you discover and the deeper you go and you realize it's not just what you see on the surface, there's more depth. You know, and, and that's a, a great thing about the tarot is it help, and storytelling. It helps you create depth um, and new understandings in, in what's in front of you and how you respond to it. Yeah, and you mentioned that word storytelling, and I want to get into it because you do say that tarot is storytelling. It absolutely is storytelling. And it doesn't matter what sort of a tarot reading you're either giving or getting. You know, you might sit down in, some, in front of someone who's going to predict what's going to happen to you. They're going to tell that to you in the form of a story. Um, everything in our life is storytelling. And, and there's two storytellers, right? There's the internal voice inside of our head, that, that voice where we're constantly like the internal self, that's storytelling. And then the external voice that, that you and I are using right now as we're communicating with one another. And so the entire suit of swords, right? There, there's uh, 14 cards in the tarot deck that are devoted specifically to the way that that we narrate what's happening to us, the way that we understand um, and how we make the story inside of our head to make sense of our life and our world. So it helps you sort of start to examine like, what stories am I telling? How am I talking to myself? And that's where you suddenly discover, well, if I can enhance or change the way I'm telling my story, I can really literally change my life. 
Mm. Which is just amazing. Amazing that we can actually do that. Uh, I wanted to get back to the actual tarot cards themselves. Uh, because they are symbolic of this magic that is possible for us. Um, the cards, they all have the same characters. They have, you know, the major arcana with their characters and my, minor arc arcana with the suits and everything. One thing I've always been curious about, though, is why are there so many different decks? So thank you for bringing up that the structure of a traditional tarot deck never changes. And that's a really wonderful thing because it is that structure that's like a skeleton that never, that, that never really alters so that it, and it fits perfectly into so many different um, things. And you always know kind of what you're getting. There are hundreds of thousands of different kinds of tarot decks on the market, which is great because if you're just learning tarot, you want to get a deck that you're beguiled by the art. So if you're into Shakespeare, there's Shakespeare tarot. If you're into fairies, there's a million fairy decks, like any kind of aesthetic, art style, theme, pop culture, television show. I think a Stranger Things tarot deck just came out. Like anything that you're into, you can chances are you can find a tarot deck with that vibe, with that artwork. Um, but that's just kind of like, um, it's kind of like the clothing, right? That that tarot deck puts on underneath all of our clothes, our bodies, right? All, we're all very similar to, our, you know, if we're fortunate to have two arms, two legs, like we're all kind of built the same, no matter what we choose to put on top of ourselves. With tarot, tarot structure, it's exactly the same thing. So you may be using like a Game of Thrones tarot deck, but the underlying structure and all of the magical esoteric stuff embedded inside of that remains the same. Okay. So if you're new to it and you're deciding to pick a, a deck, you just really kind of go with your gut. 100%. When I was just having this, con uh, con this conversation this morning with a, with a friend uh, and she was like, how do I know? And I said, you know, Tarot is a, it's a relationship. And so the same way that like when you meet someone and you're like, oh, I really kind of vibe and like this person, like I want to get to know them more. That's the kind of feeling you should have when, when a deck sparks your interest. If you're in a bookstore or looking at decks online, you'll know it's that internal spark of like, ooh, I, I want to see more of this. That's what you want to follow. And that's the deck you should purchase and start working with immediately. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is a show about dreams, as I like to say at the beginning, and there are quite a few similarities between tarot reading and dream work. Uh, for example, something that all dream workers use to help them remember their dreams and to work their dreams is to keep a dream journal. Mm. Uh, one thing you also recommend to people who are trying to understand what they see in their own readings is to keep a tarot journal. So what constitute a tarot journal and what kind of things would you put in it? So a, a, a tarot journal, and, and I always kind of preface this by saying, I feel like there tend to be two types of people in the world, the journalers and the non-journalers, right? So I think that some people might, who are non-journalers or don't love to sit down and write for 45 minutes, you know, when inspiration strikes. Um, let me just say straight away that a, a tarot journal can be as simple as like a list of like keywords so that you remember what happened when you looked at a card or you want to record something. So a tarot journal can be super duper simple. And really, it is just a record of an experience that you had with the card. Pulling a single card a day is a wonderful way to kind of get familiar because 78 cards can feel very overwhelming when you first open them up uh, and want to get, start playing with them and working with them. Um, but it's a slow process and it's, it's a never ending journey, the same way the dream interpretation is. So you might want to have something that's just about pulling a card a day and what strikes you about the card. Um, often people in tarot journals will literally sketch a card and, and that's a wonderful thing to do, even if you're not an artist, because there's a lot of secret symbolism embedded specifically in the more occult decks. So if you're sketching the card, uh, you're going to start discovering things you didn't see at first. And also, it is a form of meditation. So you're moving into the energy of that card, because there is archetypal energy behind each of the 78 cards. Um, you could keep a journal of 
readings that you do for other people. You could perhaps you're doing like magic spells with tarot and you might want to write down, you know, this is what I did and this is how I arranged my ritual and my intention. And then this is what happened. Um, so it really, tarot journals, like dream journals, I would imagine, really become a record not only of your experience with the cards or with your dreams, but also kind of an imprint of where you were at that particular time in your life. So they're wonderful to have as reference to look back on, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years later, uh, and just kind of see how far you've come. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting that you talked about sketching the dream, the tarot, because that's another part of dream work is to make a sketch or a picture of the dream. And because that can give you insights that you might not normally see. And uh, I always have this running argument with, with some of my, my dream worker friends who are total, total, total advocates in drawing the dream because I'm a terrible artist. I always say that, you know, my stick figures look like stick figures. And I, they said, it doesn't matter. Stick figures work. It works great. And so I imagine the same thing with tarot, just, you put down what is in your heart, what you feel. And, yes. and it's also, and, and the, I, so one of the great things about reading a tarot card is that it takes all of that noise in your head and gives you a focus point so that you can examine an issue in a new way. What you're saying about even, even drawing stick figures and like, I don't know, like very abstract symbolism to describe your very complex dream is giving you a doorway into exploring that dream in a way you might not have done analytically if you were telling a story about the dream so that you get to approach the experience that you had in a, in a new way. So yeah, it's not about being a great artist. It's about understanding the experience you had and, and why it's meaningful. Yeah, uh, I have one more more question to ask you that's specifically related to dreams and how you can work with tarot to help you understand your dreams, because I learned something from you that I ne never really knew. Uh, you have a technique of using tarot to help get insight into where your dream is coming from, which, which is called the dream auriculum, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Mm -hmm. So tell me about this and, and the formula you use for figuring this out, because I think this was just totally fascinating to me when I saw yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. So, and just, you know, again, I'm a huge fan of dreams as well. And I love using tarot as a doorway into everything. So there's this fun numerological thing that you can do after you've had a dream. Um, or, you know, you could even go back to recurring dreams. You know, we have those recurring dreams. You could also kind of like figure it out. Um, but you numerologically reduce the date, the time, the age you were at, and the day of the week when you had the dream, and you reduce it down to a number that, uh, that aligns with the major arcana, right? So there's 22 major arcana cards. And then with that, you kind of use that card as a doorway of understanding what the dream was about or an energy within you from which that dream sprang. So it's just a new way, an interesting way of diving into your subconscious self and, and try and figure out. And it, it, it's incredibly, incredibly helpful because it brings a whole new wealth of information to the dream that you had and a way you can understand it. Oh, that is so true. I just have one technical question about it. Yes. So you say you, you assign a number for the day that you have the dream. Let's say if you go to sleep Sunday night, is it Sunday you have the dream or Monday? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good, well, so I would say most of us tend to, unless we wake up from a dream immediately, I feel like most of us tend to wake up from our sleeping, like having our dreams right before we wake up for the day. So I would count the after, after midnight, you know what I mean? Unless I knew it was definitely a before midnight wake up or a daydream where I was, you know, where you were napping, but that's a great question. <laughs> so Sasha, you say that if you're starting off uh, with learning tarot and learning how to do it, one of the best methods to get into it is to pull a card a day. Uh, what can you get from doing this? It's kind of unbelievable, actually, the what, what you can kind of uh, gain from doing a single card a day. And it literally takes under five minutes to do. Um, 
And, but I often like to say the most profound things in life often come from the simplest things. You know, we tend to overcomplicate. So a single card a day is, and, and it's a practice I still actually do after all of these decades with the cards, I still pull a, a card every single day. But if you're just learning, um, at any point in the morning when you're feeling like kind of cozy and centered before you begin your day, maybe you're drinking your coffee, your tea, just kind of clear your mind, just clear your mind and think about the day that's coming up ahead of you. And, and, and I like to say like an easy thing to kind of focus on is what, what can I pay attention to, to have like a great day, you know, or, or you'll know, right. Um, if you have something coming up, like you have a job interview, what can I like focus on? What can give me a little bit of, of clarity and then shuffle and pull a single card. And then just allow whatever comes up. You don't have to look at a book. Just how does the image impact you? How does the color impact you? Maybe you notice the number of a card. It's the number two and two is like your angel number. Um, what is the message from the card? And just sit there for a minute. Do not worry about getting it wrong and just write down, just jot down what you get. And then go about your day. Right, and you might keep the card out so you can see it, um, or you might like just leave it next to your bed. And then at the end of your day, you know, before you go to bed, after you brush your teeth, just check back in, take a look at the image again, and see, see what hat like, and, and see how something in your day maybe aligned with that card, or it, or 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 maybe you found yourself embodying that card, or someone else did. Um, it is so simple. It is so clear. Um, uh, uh, to just clear your mind, ask a question, and a card a day, as well as starting to really get to know the cards on an intimate level, it gives you an opportunity for clarity. So I always say, like, you know, if there's something that you want in your life, start asking the cards every morning. If you ask the same question every morning for something you need an answer to, believe you me, you're going to get that answer. But you just have to show up and ask and pull a card. It's the simplest thing in the world. It'll change your life. Mm -hmm. And it is, so you are saying that it's best to do this in the morning before you start your day or get into all the activities of the day. I think so. I think that, I think morning is a great time. That's not necessarily good if people work at night and like their mornings maybe begin at 7 p.m. You know, that's when they wake up. But the reason I think the morning is good, is a wonderful time is one, you've just come out of that subconscious dream state, right? So you're still kind of in that, in that space. You're kind of more open to the unconscious. Two, I just think that the power of clearing your mind um, just in having even like 30 seconds of contemplative silence and thinking about what's coming down the road as you leap into your day, that in and of itself is a very powerful thing. And, um, and I just know that my morning coffee is sort of sacrosanct. Like it's just, I, you know, so I just can't imagine a better time, but people are different. So the, the most important thing with tarot and magic is to find what works for you. Mm -hmm. That is the morning. And that, that's always the truth. It's what works for you. Uh, and you also say that if you're just starting out, you don't have to use the whole deck, like just start with the major arcana, for instance. Yes, yes. And you know, the, the biggest impediment to anyone, the biggest challenge for people starting to work with the tarot is, am I getting it wrong? Am I wrong? Am I saying the right thing? Let me look at a book. And the fact of the matter is you're in charge of your learning. So when you were in kindergarten, you know, they didn't throw Tolstoy at you and expect you to like read it perfectly, right? Like baby steps, baby steps. So it can be, if you know, for a certain person, it might be really helpful to only use the 22 major arcana. Perhaps you only start one week and only read and shuffle the four aces or four kings, you know, or only female cards. Like you can pull apart the deck, play with it the way that you want and say that somebody out there is working maybe with their grandmother's deck and there's maybe it's an old occult deck and maybe the death card freaks you out and you're a little, take out the cards that scare you. Don't, you know, if, if something freaks you out or is challenging inside the tarot, put that to the side until you're ready 
to integrate it. Like, you know, hopefully none of us get thrown into the deep end of a swimming pool when it's time to learn to swim. And the same thing with tarot, like be gentle with yourself. It's a lifelong, never ending, beautiful relationship and process. So take it easy and take it slow. And you'll, I think, move forward faster. And one of the other things that you just also mentioned too is uh, asking questions of the card or asking questions before you pull the card. Uh, is there a way to phrase a question that gets you better results or ways that you shouldn't ask questions? Oh, Debbie, thank you for, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> uh, questions are so, so important. Uh, and how you phrase the question is, is, is really important. So you never want to ask the cards, is something going to happen 100% yes or no? So when you're asking a question like, when am I going to get the raise? When am I going to find love? How come my life sucks? Why can't I stop eating pizza? None of these questions, even if you've got an answer, would necessarily be helpful to you other than just sort of soothing yourself in the moment. You want to be proactive with tarot. So questions of how can I find the greatest romantic relationship of my life? What can I do to attract that person I'm like madly in love with? That Then you flip a card and suddenly you're like, oh, this card says maybe I should focus on my sensual energy today. And so with that, like you might go get dressed in a different way and catch that person's eye. So, so questions about how or what, what can I do? And it really comes down to asserting personal responsibility, that we're in charge of our life, we're in charge of our choices, right? Things aren't happening randomly. Um, and we all know like what would happen if we walked into a crossroad of traffic, right? So, so predictive tarot is not necessarily helpful, but it can put us on the right path for how we can approach things. So how, how questions are wonderful, how and what, what can I do, how can I do it? Yes. Very good. And it's just like with, with dream work also, if you're asking the questions, you you do it in a way that that isn't judgmental and isn't uh, that gives you more of an open-ended the possibility for a more open-ended question than just a, you know, this, this, never, but we will go on from there. Uh, mm -hmm. one of the, the fun things about tarot, I mean, there's so many things you could do with it, but uh one thing that you also talk about is using tarot to create spells so i know when when we think about the word spell we're thinking of you know this, this witch in a cauldron and coming up with you know magic weirdness and stuff like that. but it's not quite like that so tell me tell me about spells in tarot well the thing that i love about magic and spells is that it is a highly highly creative act and the minute that you kind of jump into any sort of magic, whether it's candle magic, traditional magic, you realize magic is very crafty um, and it's really what you want it to be. So if you want to put a bubbling cauldron and throw frogs in <laughs> and wear a classic, like a cloak and a witch's hat, more power to you. You know what I mean? Um, spells and rituals are sensual. It is exactly like, like um, the world's religions, right? You walk into a cathedral or a temple, nine times out of 10, you're going to smell incense, hear music, smell flowers, right? It's about magic and ritual is about opening up the senses. It's about preparing yourself, not only to do magical work, but perhaps get inspiration um, and to commune with something greater than yourself. The great thing about tarot is that literally it is, it's visual and everything is there within the deck. So you can call to the four corners, the four elements or the four suits, literally put them around you and suddenly you're creating sacred space. Um, and within that space, then you can work your magic. Now, almost any witch uh, worth her salt will tell you that in order to cast a spell, you have to visualize the outcome or, or what you kind of want around that spell. And so again, tarot acts as shorthand because tarot is visual in symbolic. So you can choose a card or cards that represent not only something perhaps that you wanna bring into your life, but the end result. Um, so you then not only work with that image, which as I said earlier, 
is archetypal. So it has its own energy kind of inside of it, the, the same way an herb or a tree carries its own archetypal energy, so does tarot. So you're automatically accessing that as well. And it just becomes this really simple way to cast a magic spell or to create sacred space around you. Um, it's incredibly convenient, incredibly portable, fits in your pocketbook, <laughs> you know? Oh, give me an example of a spell that you could do using tarot. Oh, okay. So let's say you're looking for love. Um, and one of my favorite places to traditionally cast magic is on my kitchen table because the kitchen is already, like I feel like cookbooks and spell books, you know, it's all the same stuff. It's, it's giving you the instructions of how to get what you want, whether it's a cake or a big, sexy, delicious lover. So let's just say that, you want to uh, bring love into your life. Um, you would, you could uh, take a, a lovely cleansing bath in, in salt water to just kind of cleanse yourself and prepare yourself for the work ahead. Um, you would go maybe to your kitchen table. You would have the four aces, the four elements set aside because you always would love to, it's always a great idea to open up the space with kind of request to the four elements and you can just call to the card. And so you begin working your way around the table saying, I, I call to the East, to the suit of cups to aid me in my work. And you make your way around the circle. And then perhaps you sit there then at your table with your candles blazing, a little bit of incense and start focusing on the lover's card, right? And start moving deeper into the lover's card and then start thinking about what kind of love that you'd like to bring into your life. And maybe you journal about it, you write about it, and you, you open yourself up and put the call out to the universe and say, you know, please bring this to me. And then you end it and then you you know, go counterclockwise and you thank the energies for being with you. And then the best thing you can do after you cast a magic spell is forget you ever cast it and, and just know that you made the call. And, and if it works and the spell comes true, it was meant to be. And if it doesn't, it's a good thing because it wasn't meant to be. And I often say to people in classes, you know, could you imagine if everything we ever wanted came true? You know, you'd still be married to like, you'd be married to a doofus guy, like from high school, right? Like we don't always know <laughs> what's best for ourselves. Um, and thank goodness so many things haven't, you know, come true that you once upon wanted. Uh, so the universe, uh, the creative principle gives us that delay. So if a spell doesn't work, it really wasn't meant to be. Um, and then you rearrange and try again for something new. Uh, can someone use tarot to cast a bad spell on somebody else? Well, of course, you know, it's like a gun or a sword or, you know, a good priest or a bad priest. Like anything can be used benevolently. Anything can be used with bad intention. And, and there's plenty of readers, you know, we've all heard the stories about people who get, you know, have been like bamboozled out of $600,000 by a tarot reader who kind of had, you know, or, or a psychic. Or, so yes, of course, there's any anything with ill intent can be like can be done through or you or tarot can be used for that the same way yeah you would use a gun or your legal team to go out and do really awful things so yeah tarot is no different than anything else hey we've been speaking about the magic of tarot with sasha graham I hope we've enjoyed today's program if so please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future episodes until next time, this is Debbie Spector Weissman saying, sweet dreams, everybody. Mm -hmm.